Well, if you're wondering just how much special treatment Donald Trump gets as a defendant, the answer is more special treatment than any defendant in American history, much more. The proof of that once in history level of special treatment came in a Manhattan courtroom today when the judge presiding over the civil fraud case against defendant Donald Trump said something that no judge has ever said before, speaking directly to defendant Trump, who was sitting under oath in the witness stand. The judge said to him, you can attack me. In the 400 years of courtroom history in America dating back to the colonial courts, no judge has ever said that in court to any defendant or any witness until today. That's how much special treatment Donald Trump is getting. On the witness stand today, in that fraud case, Donald Trump did not wait for the judge's permission to attack him. Donald Trump began attacking the judge instead of answering questions right away. And he attacked New York's attorney general from the witness stand, something no witness has ever done before in a New York courtroom. In one of the judge's many failed attempts to get Donald Trump to answer the questions being put to him by an assistant attorney general, the judge told Donald Trump, you can attack me, you can do whatever you want, but answer the questions. Donald Trump did the first two of those things. He attacked the judge. He did whatever he wanted, but he didn't do the third thing. He did not answer the questions. And it does not matter. Donald Trump's lawyers did not ask for a jury trial in the case, which doesn't prevent Donald Trump from constantly complaining that there's no jury. Deciding whether Donald Trump and his sons committed fraud in falsely exaggerating the value of their holdings was entirely up to the judge in the case who has already reached a verdict that Donald Trump and his two sons did indeed commit fraud. The proceeding going on now in the courtroom is about nothing other than how big a penalty should the judge impose on Donald Trump and his sons and the family business. As has been said many times on this program, no sane criminal defense lawyer would ever allow Donald Trump to testify under oath in court. But this is not a criminal trial. And that's why you're seeing Donald Trump testify, which we will not see in any of the four criminal trials Donald Trump is facing. Because this is a civil trial, the defendant can be called to the witness stand by either side in the case. And so the attorney general has called Donald Trump as a witness to show the judge that Donald Trump was actively involved in what the judge has already ruled was a fraud. But the judge already knows that Donald Trump was actively involved in that fraud based on Donald Trump's under oath pretrial deposition and the rest of the evidence in the case. Today, the judge made it clear to Donald Trump that if he refused to answer a question by making a campaign speech instead, as Donald Trump did many times, the judge would then take a negative inference from Donald Trump's refusal to answer. In other words, if the attorney general asked Donald Trump if he approved of a false valuation and Donald Trump rambled on and on and refused to answer that question, the judge could then infer that Donald Trump was simply trying not to admit the truth that he did knowingly approve false valuations. Donald Trump made some admissions under oath that were lost to many observers of the trial in all of the bluster of the day. When asked why the square footage of his New York apartment was listed as triple the actual size, Donald Trump admitted under oath that the exaggerated square footage created a false valuation. Trump said, the number was too high. The attorney general introduced a deed to Donald Trump's Florida residence, which he operates as a private club because he cannot afford to live there without the income from the private club. The deed to that property says, 
the club and Trump intend to forever extinguish their right to development or use the property for any purpose other than club use. That is why the actual value of the property is severely limited. The deed severely limits the possible purposes of a sale. It cannot be sold for a higher value purpose. When confronted with the deed, limiting the value of that property, witness Trump seized on one word in the deed, the word intend. Trump said, intend doesn't mean we will do it. Because Donald Trump is one of the very stupidest people ever to be charged with business fraud, and because his demonstrably ineffectual lawyers obviously do not have the skills to prepare their client for even the simplest and most obvious questions, Donald Trump incriminated himself and his children with the only one word answer that he gave all day. Question, who within the Trump organization was responsible for preventing and detecting fraud? Answer, everybody. And there, Donald Trump destroyed any shred of defense in the case for himself and his co-defendants, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump. Everybody. You could spend weeks trying to think of a stupider answer than that, and you cannot come up with one. Now remember, going into his testimony today, the verdict was already rendered on the fraud that Donald Trump and his sons committed. The question now is only, will they face the maximum penalty for that fraud, which could include fines of up to $250 million? Donald Trump's job as a witness today was to give the judge a reason any reason to lower the penalty against him and his sons. His job was to make the judge think the fraud wasn't Donald Trump's fault, wasn't Donald Trump Jr.'s fault, wasn't Eric Trump's fault. It was the accountant's fault or something like that. That wouldn't eliminate the penalty, but it could significantly soften it. And instead, Donald Trump continued his war with the judge who is going to decide the fate of Donald Trump's business, and Donald Trump incriminated himself and his kids. Question, who within the Trump organization was responsible for preventing and detecting fraud? Answer, everybody. Lawyers dream of moments like that in court, where you get the witness on the stand who thinks he's the smartest guy in the room, which is something only stupid people think in courtrooms, and he gives you a fast and loose answer to the key question in the case. Good lawyers never make the key question the first or the last question. They never let it stand up like that. They fold it into the middle of the witness examination and try to use it when they think the witness feels most comfortable, most in control. And so, a couple of hours after the judge told Donald Trump, you can do whatever you want, Donald Trump stupidly felt comfortable and in control and then said the stupidest possible thing he could say as a witness. Everybody, everybody was in on the fraud. That was Donald Trump's testimony today about his family business. When I saw the imagery of Donald Trump in the courtroom today, I thought of you. Let, let's take a look at that. Uh, I was wondering what you thought uh, when you saw this image of Donald Trump. This is, these are the cameras that are allowed in the court uh, before the proceeding officially gets under the underway, just so they can establish uh, the a photographic image of the room for audiences. What do you see when you see that man sitting at that table? I, I felt the need to tell him that pouting is not an affirmative defense. Uh, but he, he clearly didn't get the message. Um, he probably thinks he's looking stern and he's staring everybody down, but he does look like a disgruntled toddler. And I think you've covered really thoroughly uh, the fact that his lack of intelligence has gotten him in trouble in his testimony, but 
The other thing, one other thing that has is his misperception of the kind of control he has, which is to say he thinks he's in control, but he's not in control at all. Yeah, and that seems to be something that uh, the attorney general actually wanted to encourage in him as a witness, the feeling, please be comfortable, please feel like you're in control of this, because then you just won't see us coming when, when we have these questions where you will incriminate literally everybody in the family business. Yeah, it was masterfully done. And it, it was, at first, very frustrating that the judge wasn't intervening in any way. I think anybody else would, would have been slapped with contempt charges and we'd be sitting in a county jail right now. But as you mentioned, the prosecutor clearly wanted Donald to feel comfortable and confident in saying whatever he felt the need to say. And I think that aligned really well with Donald's unconscious impulse to, to twist what's actually going on. He's being accused on one level of being an entirely unsuccessful businessman. He's being accused uh, of being a total failure. And in order to counter that, he needs to start bragging about how much he's worth, that he needs to start insulting people and feel like he is dominating. And as you alluded to, it made him walk into every single trap that was set for him and probably some that weren't even set intentionally. You know what Thank I was so thinking? Much. You know what I was thinking when I was listening to the audiobook? I was thinking a couple of things. One, perfect for the long Thanksgiving drive to yes. grandma's, mm -hmm. perfect for the long flight to anywhere for Thanksgiving. But I was also thinking it's it's an alarming tale, but so soothing to listen to. <laughs> how how did that magical formula come about? Trying to administer it like a drug, sort yeah. of like this will make yeah. it go down easily. Yeah. Easy. You know, I um, the audiobook producer, uh, the editor and producers working with this, Scott Sherrod in particular, um, ha is a relaxing guy. He's the and, greatest guy. And yeah. e with every audiobook that I've done, this is the fourth mm -hmm. one that I've done now, um, you, you, I always start off reading, and then by the time you get to the end of the 300 whatever pages, you're like into a rhythm and it's fine or whatever. And Scott always does the same thing where he says, it's great. You're totally done. It's awesome. Do you want to do chapter one again now? And then I go back and I do chapter one again with my new relaxed cadence mm -hmm. that it took me the entire book to earn. Because otherwise I would come out of the gate being like, you guys, you guys. Yeah. And it yeah. would be very I, I, I've done two with Scott. And what I dream of is, and maybe we can work out this deal with the network. Mm -hmm. They get Scott to come in here. And just talk to us during commercial breaks. <laughs> just, hey, Rachel, that was really good. Yeah. I mean, that's just incredibly soothing. Um, okay. Yeah. Back he to also, the I also have with me his entire list of German pronunciation that he gave me for all. I mean, there's a lot of German. Oh. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff about Nazis in here. So there's all these German words. And I'm like, I know how to spell them because I've been working with printed material all this time. I have no idea how to right. pronounce any of these right. things. He made it so easy. So I could yeah. I could speak fake German for all but the parts of it that yeah, I needed to. That is the kind of detail. Yeah. So, you know, I was intrigued because um, the podcast that covers a lot of the same ground is so mesmerizing and wonderful. And the book has more. Mm. And the audio book has more because we get to hear original source material like Meet the Press from 1880 or something like that, <laughs> right? like way back there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that was, I mean, when you're doing a podcast, right, it's, you know, you have to kind of pick a specific arc. It's one story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And a book is the same thing, but the arc is bigger. Mm. And one of the things that I wanted to do in the book that I really didn't even try to do in the podcast was talk about how important and influential and like what a big deal the bad guys were who were involved yes. with this stuff. Yes. Like in the podcast, for example, it didn't talk at all about Henry Ford, didn't talk about Charles Lindbergh, right. didn't really talk very much about Charles Coughlin. But like, I really think it's worth understanding, particularly for the resonance for what it means today, 
that this was not a fringe movement. Mm -hmm. These were not guys like hanging out in the parking lot at the dance. Mm -hmm. These were like the people who were running the country. The most influential people in the country were implicated in some of the worst stuff. And that, to me, helps in terms of thinking about this as kind of an instruction book from the past, because it means that the Americans who fought these guys back in the 30s and 40s, they were up against you know, the most famous industrialist in the country, the consensus national hero who was more famous mm -hmm. than anybody in the country other than the president, the biggest media figure the country has ever had, the biggest political organization the country had at the time. It was the biggest, most connected, most influential forces in American politics and culture, and still the anti-fascists won. And so we should learn what they did. Yeah, uh, this, so this is a chapter in America's history of fascist outbreaks mm -hmm. and, and, and fascist uh, kind of collectives that have hopes and dreams that 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 we are now seeing resurface again here. Well, we saw, I mean, at the, there's no, right, there's no Hitler but Hitler. There's no Nazis yeah, but yeah, Nazis. Yeah. But this, there was a time at this, you know, in the lead up to World War II when we think of, you know, the Nazis were over there and they were bad guys and we were the good guys over here and we went over there and beat them and it was over. This is the story about Americans who not only sided with the Germans in World War II, but in some cases worked for Germany mm -hmm. and were trying to impose an American form of Nazism here. And they were surprisingly well-connected and influential and far along in their plans. And because they didn't succeed, we have decided that it must have been a fringe thing, but it really wasn't. In the middle of it, it really, really wasn't. And so that, to me, is just, it's electric. Because even though, you know, there will never be bad guys exactly like those bad guys. There will never be anything like Germany from 1933 to 1945 under Hitler. Still, the idea of fighting fascism, fighting a big, powerful, connected, anti-democratic movement, um, particularly one that has a big crush on authoritarian dictators mm -hmm. in foreign lands, um, that is something that we have done. And um, fighting them in the courts, fighting them in journalism, fighting them in activism, the you know institutions like the church and the military and unions and other American institutions standing up and fighting them. It's great stuff, and it's I do feel like it's an instruction book for us. Yeah, and and if you have if you don't have an incredibly detailed knowledge of American history, which very few people do, some some people have knowledge of a certain period, but but you you get to think. Oh, that couldn't happen here. That couldn't happen here. This is one of those books that tells you, oh, it happened here. Yeah. It happened here already. Yeah. Oh, by the way, here are the ways it can happen here again. In your last hour, you did a report without using the word fascism about what the Trump plan is for day one of another Trump presidency. And that is fascism. They want, according to Devlin Barrett and his colleagues at The Washington Post, this new reporting, they want to invoke the Insurrection Act on day one of Trump's second term. What is the Insurrection Act for? That allows you to use the U.S. military on U.S. soil against U.S. civilians. And they want to do it on day one. Well, why do you want to be able to do that on day one? It is not because you have a small d democratic project in mind for this country. And you, you will not be surprised that that kind of thinking can happen in America and have followers in America if you read prequel. Rachel Maddow's new book, which shows you this has been in the American body politic for quite some time. Now. It keeps coming up and it will probably come up again after we beat it this time. But one of the things we can do for, to beat it this time is to look at the generation that did it before us. They had some good ideas. The audio book is right here on, <laughs> on this phone, uh, courtesy of uh, Audible, which you get, is, does a great job. Uh, and uh, the, the book is available. Oh, by the way, I mean, I, I just feel like you know, millions of people. If you look at what's on your screen right now, that uh, here it is. I'll hold it here. Your Christmas shopping's done. Like, 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 <laughs> right now, right here. You How many Rachel Maddow fans do you have in the family? In your family? Come on, this this does it. You don't have to think, uh, Rachel. <laughs> you are very kind, Lauren. I'm looking for a bump in the audiobook sales overnight. I'm going to claim that. Bump okay. Was from the show. I'll cut you in. Oh, I don't know. No, 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 no. I, no, no. I just yes. want. I just want to see what the show can do in audiobooks. So buy the audiobook. It'll make Lawrence really happy. There you go. That's the commercial. Yeah. Rachel, thank you very <laughs> thank you much Lawrence. for joining us. Come back anytime. Indeed. Thank you, my friend.